Well, I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome to this week's episode of Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. It is September the 22nd, 1982, and we were going to be talking about the movie Harper from 1966. And I am thus 15 months old. 15 months old, indeed. (laughs) So you're, you're very advanced for your age. Uh, so Harper is a movie that I first saw around three or so years ago, probably before I had even finished watching it. I'm like, this is going to be a movie night movie at some point. It's You only saw it that recently? About three years ago. I wow. think this is probably the fourth or fifth time I've seen it. Wow. In uh, three years. That's pretty, yes, pretty good for you. One of those viewings was the audio commentary, okay. which some of the information I'll, I'll give out is from that audio commentary. Uh, but this uh, film has a 100% Rotten Tomatoes score. Uh, again, it's from 1966. The name of the film is Harper. It's directed by a man named Jack Smite. Uh, Jack Smite was a fairly prolific working director. He is probably best known for films such as Midway and Airport 1975, the second best of the airport films. <laughs> uh, he also directed a film I'm rather fond of that's not particularly well known called No Way to Treat a Lady from 1968. It is a serial killer film starring Rod Steiger and Lee Remick. Uh, It's quite good. The story uh, is uh, adapted from the 1949 Ross MacDonald novel, The Moving Target. Uh, It was updated from the late 1940s to the 1960s. Uh, And in the process of doing that, they changed the name of the character, who in the original novel is named Archer, to Harper. And purportedly, the reason for that chain, change was that um, Paul Newman had a fondness for names for his characters that started with the letter H, uh, owing to the success of a film he made a few years earlier called HUD. Uh, the adaptation, the screenplay, was uh, done by a prolific writer named William Goldman. Uh, Goldman uh, also wrote the screenplays for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and okay. All the President's Men. Yeah, But he is definitely best known and remembered for a novel he wrote called The Princess Bride. Wow. Which he uh, later adapted for the film version. And I think in this film, you can see some of the uh, verbal jousting, some of of the fun he has with language, and certain tonal similarities uh, in parts. Uh, Harper was a very successful movie. It made $12 million off of a $3.5 million budget. It has a very uh, impressive cast. Uh, Paul Newman, Lauren Bacall, Julie Harris, Arthur Hill, Janet Leigh, Pamela Tiffin, Robert Wagner, Shelley Winters, and Strother Martin. Uh, the story concerns Lou Harper, who is a uh, private investigator, of course played by Newman, uh, who is uh, given a referral from a friend of his who used to be uh, the district attorney uh, and is now a personal lawyer for a wealthy man who lives in a place called... Uh, Santa Th- Teresa, California, which yeah. is not actually a real place. There, there is a Santa Teresa, California, which is a neighborhood in San Jose, but as a city and as a city located two or so two or so hours away from Los Angeles, I think they said, uh, it's not an actual city. It's a construct uh, for the film, possibly uh, for the novel. Uh, Anyway, he is referred by his friend, Arthur, uh, to the wife of a very rich man. Uh, The name of the rich man is Ralph Sampson. Ralph Sampson has disappeared, and his wife uh, is hiring Harper to find him, not because she cares, but because uh, she's pretty sure that he's cheating on her again and kind of likes to to needle him. And so this uh, sets the stage for uh, a protracted... uh, investigation, a lot of supporting characters, a lot of clever dialogue, a lot of fun moments, and also a certain darkness that, uh, especially uh, towards the end of the film, which I'm sure we'll get into. Again, the the film was quite successful. It actually spawned a sequel that came out in 1975 called The Drowning Pool, in which Newman uh, plays opposite his real-life wife, uh, Joanne Woodward. I have not seen this film, though I have looked for it. Apparently it is not easily available at least not on dvd i can I'm sure i could probably get it was it based on, on any of the novelizations you know, I'm do you not, know i'm not sure uh, i just know that it's the char- the same character as in harper hmm. as the lead well i mean just i mean you know i like to, to read books that mm-hmm. movies are based on so as soon as you mentioned the name of the book while we were sitting here i went and added that to my yeah. goodreads list so mm-hmm. yeah so uh i think i mentioned to you yesterday that this was the movie i was going to show 
you kind of came into this, I assume, with little to no knowledge of what yeah, this was I, about. Yeah, I was busy, so I didn't have a chance to look it up. Mm-hmm. I, honestly, when I was walking out the door to come over here, my wife said, what are you guys watching tonight? And I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> had, had I... Uh, I've heard of this film. I had never seen it before. But, of course, if you liked it, Los Angeles detective stories, <laughs> you've heard of this. Yeah. So It's a great Los Angeles detective story. Yeah. Uh, I really liked the uh, the use of the Hollywood Hills. Yeah. A lot of the location shoots are, are pretty neat. I think I recognized several of the locations, though I'm not 100% positive because they are earlier in L.A. than, I am, than I'm used to seeing mm-hmm. in film. Indeed. But I'm pretty sure I recognized two or three of the locations. I might have to look up the filming locations later and, mm-hmm. and see if I'm that right. That might be a fun... I wonder if anybody's done a Harper filming locations video. That might be fun to Pro- see. Well, I don't know. It's a little. It's a little bit obscure for the modern YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what did you? What did you think, Harper? What? What? Uh, what struck you? First impressions. So, in some ways, the plot was relatively simple, and at the same time, it was com- complex. Mm. There's a lot of players involved. Not only is there a lot of players, but it kind of bounces back and forth between some of those players. Mm-hmm. Like you think, oh, okay, mm-hmm. this person is done right. with in the story, mm-hmm. and then they come back. And there's also multiple things going on. Yeah. Uh, they have a minor spoiler. Uh, there's a largely unrelated immigrant smuggling operation yeah. that they kind of stumble upon, and some people that are involved in that are involved in the, the disappearance uh, of Samson. And there's some double crossing within the groups that's involved in, in the disappearance of Samson, who's I, kidnapped. Maybe I should have seen it earlier, but I didn't really see Albert's involvement until towards the end. Yeah. Well, this this again, as as is true of our podcast, this is a big spoiler. Um, I don't know that you can call it a spoiler when the movie's from 1966. <laughs> yeah, that's but, true. Yeah. But so there's a lot of a lot of things going on, a lot of people involved. In, uh, you find out that that Samson is is not a good man. Nobody really likes Samson. And, and one of the things... And nobody's really going to miss Samson. Nobody's really going to miss Samson. And, and one of the first things I think of in this film is that it's kind of fun, that it kind of reminds me a little bit of an old Dragnet episode. And they spent a lot of time with kind of quir- quirky side characters. It's like, here's a bit with the quirky side character. We don't really need it, but it's fun to have. But it's actually a pretty dark film, especially towards the end. And I don't think any character in this film, other than probably Harper and his wife, come off working, looking any better at the end of the film than they do at the beginning. Everybody here is kind of unpleasant. Even the people that seem on the surface to be quite likable have, have kind of dark things in them, and uh, Albert uh, would be a prime example of that. Yeah. Albert was tempted by circumstance to do something he should not have done, uh, and the film uh, ends... In a kind of ambiguous ending, and I, I generally am a fan of ambiguous endings. How ambiguous do you think that was? Yeah, that's true. I thought it was pretty straightforward. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that. Uh, I think Harper's fine. Well, obviously he's fine because there's a sequel. Albert's not going. Albert's not going to kill him, even no. though he has reason to. And he, and even if he did, he's, they're not going to do anything he, to each other. He, at that yeah, point. and he's not. I mean, how's he going to make up an excuse for doing it so last minute? There's yeah. no time to even even do that if he wanted to. Yeah. But the, uh, that thing at the end isn't. I mean, that's not what this film is about. Like, like no. the, the plot is really not what this movie is about. The twists and turns and the character development, and perhaps more than anything, the dialogue. Uh, well, there's it, some great sarcastic dialogue from Harper in this. There's film. some great sarcastic dialogue. There's also some great kind of side scenes, like that whole scene where Harper calls his wife. Yeah. From the uh, the bar restroom. Hmm. And plays a gag. Like, when you look back on that, you're like, wait a minute. What did that have to do, anything at all to do with the movie? Well, that subplot about him and his wife, uh, that, and I love the opening scene of this film. Yeah. Where Harper's in bed, uh, the alarm goes off, he stays kind of thinking. He's not even asleep when the alarm comes off. And he, he, he eventually turns off the alarm. It's dark. There's a test pattern on the TV. He opens the window and bright light comes in. So the impression you have is this is he's come waking up at the crack of dawn. He ain't waking up at the crack of dawn. And how he's uh, looking for, what, coffee coffee grounds? He needs yeah. to make his morning coffee, and he's, he, he finds that he's out, and then he looks in the, uh, the, trash, the trash can, the previous and day. he has this 10 seconds or so of debate going on in his face. Am I going to use 
the coffee grounds in the trash can. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Which is entertaining because then he doesn't even, he only takes one sip of the coffee. And it's just, yeah, exactly. And it's, and he's, he's disgusted by it. Would you say that Harper is a film noir? I'm kind of torn about that. I would say this is a bit of a classic. Well, not a bit of a classic. This is a classic. I'm not sure that I would consider this L.A. noir. What do you think of that? Or, or, or film, film noir. Film noir. I, I'm not sh- Either way, I don't know. I'm not sure. What do you think? I'm not sure I could call it film noir either, even though I, th- the novel that was based on from 1949, if they had made this in 1949, it would have definitely been a film noir. It's, it's got uh, all the, these tragic, flawed characters and the double crosses, and, and Harper gets hit on the head quite a few times. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the film is also, even though a fair amount of it takes place at night, it's, it's also a much brighter film. It's a very California film. It doesn't have the kind of the seamy so much of the seamy quality as, as one usually associates with the film, nor and it's in color. Uh, so the color films of a similar type are sometimes referred to as, as neo-noirs, but I'm not sure I'm even comfortable calling it that. Uh, it's definitely a detective story. Uh, I could probably refer to it as noir light, but it's just not completely film noir, even though there's certainly an influence from that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can certainly see the influence of a film noir but I'm not sure that I would call this in and of itself film noir. I wanted to take a time to go over some quotes from the IMDb page. Some of the dialogue. Because there's so much fun dialogue in this film, and Paul Newman is so good at delivering it. And, and you just get the essence of this, this character. He's, he's very cynical. He's very sarcastic. He's very good at his job. He's got a, a great read on people. Uh, the way he plays his wife. There's this subplot about how his wife is going to divorce him, and he never seems that concerned about it because he knows... That he can, and over the course of the film, he succeeds in winning her back relatively easily. Uh, the whole storyline only but takes also place over about three days. Relatively temporarily. Yeah, that you got the feeling that there's been a lot of back and forth. I mean, when he sees Albert for the first time, it's like, well, how are things with your wife? Never better. So <laughs> it's like this is a constant thing that I don't know how long it had been since he'd seen Albert, possibly years. Yeah. But that it's like, oh, Harper always has the the problem with his wife. So here, here are a few fun lines uh, from the film. And this first one, I think, might be my favorite line. And it's got to be a real Goldman line. I, I, I don't imagine it was in the original book. The bottom is loaded with nice people, Albert. Only cream and bastards rise. Yeah, I think that probably... I could see that easily being your favorite line in the movie. Mm-hmm. Why so fast, Harper? You trying to impress me? You got a way of starting conversations that end conversations. Why is your wife divorcing you? You got a way of starting conversations that end conversations. <laughs> it's two after six. We don't serve domestic after six, only imported. Terrific. Keep the change. There is no change. Keep it anyway. Why what do you do or why do you do this kind of crummy work what do you do this kind of crummy work for anyway? What are you trying to be funny? I do it because I believe in the United Nations and Southeast Asia and you think it's funny if your life depends on what goes through the Panama Canal? What about the English pound? I'll tell you something. As long as there's a Siberia, you'll find Lou Harper on the job. Are you putting me on? Jeez, I don't think so. I think that might have been my favorite line in the movie. Uh, kill the body and the head dies. You were hired by a bitch to find scum. I used to be a sheriff before I passed my literacy test. Yeah, that was another har- great line. harassing that sheriff. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, just real fun dialogue in it. Uh, this film makes me really interested in the sequel. It's a 10-year belated sequel, and I don't know how, how good that uh, bodes for it, but obviously uh, Newman enjoyed playing the character. If and it'd be interesting to see to it, more. I would kind of assume that there would, you'd maintain a certain amount of quality. I mean, just bringing in him back as the star of the movie, you'd assume, I mean, Paul Newman can carry a movie. Mm. We all know that. So I'd assume that it couldn't be a terrible movie, but maybe it's just a middling movie. I don't know. What does old stick mean? The the one guy's always calling Harper old stick. You tell him old stick. Well, old stick. I'm not sure I know that reference. Yeah, it sounds vaguely British, and it it's like an insult, but not an insult. Like like it's vague enough. The way he uses it is kind of demeaning. Yeah. But it's not necessarily demeaning if used in a different uh, context. Uh, a couple other 
things that, uh, or at least one other thing that I looked up here is they talk about the wealth of uh, Samson, say that he was worth uh, $20 million. Oh, yeah. So use the trusty inflation calculator online and $20 million in 1966 money in 2019 would be worth $159,818,079.04. That's interesting that they ran that down to the cent for you. And they do. And then the 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 ransom, uh, which is asked for uh, to release Samson, is $500,000 in 1966, uh, which today would be $3,995,451.98. Hmm. So... Uh, I always find the inflation calculator just fun in movie to give you a sense of, of what value they're talking about when they're when they're talking about uh, about that. Uh, another interesting side note: uh, you may have noticed in the opening credits that they talk about an original song that's in the film. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The song is very briefly in the film. I think we maybe hear a minute of the song. Uh, Julie Harris uh, sings it in the piano bar. Uh, oh, okay. It is called. I Hate This Living Alone. And that song was written by Andre Previn. Andre Previn is an EGOT. There's not very many of them. An EGOT is a man who has won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. Oh. So I want to say wow. there's something like a dozen huh. that have ever lived, like a dozen to 16, something in that area. So that's... It's kind of the triple crown, in in a way of, of well, more than a entertainment, crown. quadruple crown of entertainment. Just listening to that song, you wouldn't think Audrey Previn would be in that uh, yeah. class, but it was just something that 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 he threw out there. Uh, again, we can talk a, a little bit about the cast because the cast is phenomenal. You know, the, I was impressed with, I, as much as anything else, the by the interaction between the cast. Mm-hmm. You know, as Harper moves through this movie and interacts with the different members of the cast, it's just such quality and maintains the quality be- mm-hmm. between every interaction. Because pretty much every interaction has Harper in it. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't recall if there's any scene we see in the entire film that Harper's not in. Not that I recall. Uh, so you get to see how he reacts uh, and relates to these different characters and how some of those relations change because certain people he finds out are not on the up and up number of times uh lauren bacall plays mrs sampson what did you think of her that was she's not in a lot of the film but she leaves an impression it's an interesting role for her um but yeah she leaves an impression especially kind of there at the end of the film and, oh yeah she yeah. Is, she is the the bitch that is hired to find that hires uh harper, harper to, to find, find scum uh and she she doesn't like her husband hasn't liked her husband she says she was in love with him when they married but uh, up, until they, up until they married, and that he almost instantly started cheating on her, and she got involved in uh, like a horse riding accident and is a semi invalid, and his, her stepdaughter thinks that basically she did that on purpose, yeah, uh, just to kind of saddle the father with her and and not to really have to do anything, you know, uh, there'd be minimum demands on her, but that moment at the end uh, where. Harper calls her and says, you got, you know, it's got to tell Miranda, Miranda, you know, what happened to her father and just the delight in her face. Oh, Miranda, I have something to tell you. Oh, you, you hate her there. It's, yeah. It's a great little performance. Again, I, I don't think she's in more than five minutes in this film, but she definitely uh, leaves an impression in it. She's in a little bit more <clears throat> than five minutes. I mean, that one first scene where she's meeting with Harper is probably five minutes in and of itself. But after that first interaction with Harper, yeah, there's probably a grand total of maybe another five minutes, if that. And putting her in a detective film is great because that's what she comes from. She comes from doing those uh, film, those detective films uh, with Humphrey Bogart, uh, who was her first husband. Uh, Julie Harris plays Betty Freely, uh, who's a uh, piano, a uh, jazz pianist who is involved in a kidnapping scheme. Julie Harris had a, a pretty long career. Uh, she was in a film called The Hiding Place in the 1970s about hiding Jews in Nazi-occupied oh, Europe. Yeah. She was also uh, James Dean's love interest in East of Eden uh, back in the middle middle 50s. Albert uh, Hill, I don't know very well, he plays Albert Graves, Arthur Hill. Uh, I thought he was, he was quite good in it. Uh, Janet Lee plays Harper's wife, Susan. Uh, Pamela Tiffin plays Miranda Sampson, the daughter of the missing man. 
Pamela Tiffin is really a gorgeous uh, woman who um, I don't think she had a particularly long career. I think most of what she did was probably in the early to middle 60s. I think I've seen her in probably two other films. Uh, she is in a Billy Wilder comedy from about 1961 called One, Two, Three. And she was also in a film version of uh, Summer and Smoke that came out early 60s. Uh, Robert Wagner plays Alan Taggart, uh, who is uh, Samson's pilot. Uh, Samson likes to go to Las Vegas to gamble and then uh, fly to his office in Los Angeles from Santa Teresa. He's considered to be uh, kind of a, an unnecessary expense by his uh, lawyer, Arthur. Uh, and of course, he is involved in the kidnapping. It's kind of a fun part for Wagner. Uh, did you see him as being not trustworthy, or when did you see him as being not trustworthy? Oh, I saw him right from the beginning as not being mm. as being not trustworthy. The question is, what was his level of involvement for me? Yeah, yeah. So, and for for a little bit in the film, he's basically the sidekick to yeah. Harper, but he's kind of there to throw him off off the scent. Well, and that was the the thing that got me with him was because from the beginning I was like, you can't trust this guy. What's mm-hmm. what's this guy's involvement? And then he's Harper's sidekick for long enough. It kind of resets that and pulls that danger meter back down. You're kind of like, oh, well, maybe I was wrong about this guy. And then uh, Robert Weber is in it as Dwight Troy. And uh, Shelley Winters has the Shelley Winters part, uh, playing a uh, once uh, beautiful actress from the early 50s who got fat. And, yeah. and sadly, that was basically the last 20 plus years of Shelley Winter's career was variations on that joke from Lolita into the Poseidon Adventure and on. She's she's a fine fine enough actress. She's just really kind of kind of slumming it in in, in this film, playing a playing a floozy has been. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a great cast. I think it's a fun story. I guess what would uh, do you have anything else you wanted to share on, on Harper or some fun no, thoughts? No, I think I would rate this three and a half stars on the four star scale. On the ten star scale, I'd say this is, I'd probably give this an eight on the ten star scale. It's fun. It's definitely one I'd, if, you know, opportunity comes along, I'd readily watch it again. Mm-hmm. It's a good film. Go check it yeah, out. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. I'd give it the same score. I'd give it eight on a ten scale and three and a half uh, on a four star scale. In some ways, you can say that there's there's not a lot to it, not a lot of substance to it, but it's just so well done for what it is. So now, this leads me into kind of a strange question that I, I'm guessing that when you hear my question, you won't have seen this question coming. All okay. right. This leads me to a unique question of, who do you think is the better actor, Paul Newman or Robert Redford? Paul Newman or Robert Redford? That's a good question. Good question. They're both very good actors, but they both very much have the lanes, their lanes that they occupy. Not a lot of stretching. Like, there, there's not a lot of time. Like, I can't think of a time. Can you think of a film where you've either seen Robert Redford or Paul Newman cast against type? They always play That's a, a certain question. type of character. I really can't think of one, at least not off the top of my head. Uh, they're very comparable. It'd be really hard to uh, put one over the other. If if I had to, I probably would go Redford, because Redford came along a little later, and, and Newman started off in kind of a different way of acting, kind of a more rigid way, because he came, well, he, I believe he came from the theater, but, you know, he was in these 1950s melodramas and, and things. And so there was a particular way you acted in those, whereas uh, Redford was about a decade or so younger than Newman uh, and came into theater and film acting when those styles were different and closer to what they are now, uh, which generally interpreted as a broader ranging. Yeah. I suppose you. I might even consider my own answer to this question a little bit of a cop out. I would say younger, Paul Newman, older Robert Redford. As as they both aged, I think Robert Redford is the better actor. Mm-hmm. But starting out and in, and in younger in their careers, I think Paul Newman was mm-hmm. the better actor. So would you say that when he got older, he? Uh, it's not that he got to be a less good a, an actor, but he got more set in his. I think Robert Redford got better as he got older. Mm-hmm. 
when you, when you bring this up, it what comes to mind is a film from 1982, from this year, uh, called The Verdict, which is, off the top of my head, probably the best Paul Newman performance that I can think of, where he pay, plays a has-been lawyer who has an opportunity to take an important case, and it kind of forces him to become the great lawyer again that he once was. That's just what came to mind when talking yeah. talking about this. Yeah, I think I have seen that film, but I don't recall. I might have to revisit that. Mm. But some of our future standalones, I will one day make you watch All is Lost. And I mm. think that might suffice as well as anything yeah. else to illustrate my point. So, yeah, I hear yeah. good things. Yeah. I wasn't impressed by that movie, but I was also impressed by this movie. So, mm. yeah, we'll see how that turns out. So, I think next week we're going to be starting into the Robin Hoods and start our April theme month. Uh, is that still the plan? That's the plan. Yep. So that'll be coming up shortly. Uh, I'm hoping to get these edited out here shortly. We've got the standalones in March, and I hope to get those out. Those might actually be out before the Warner Herzog Warner episode. Herzog month. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And we will see you later from Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. Start. It's going. So, there's a new establishment uh, not too far from me called the Root Beer Store. Where is this, actually? The Root Beer Store is on State. It's across from the Jordan Commons. Oh, okay. It's just a tiny little building. Yeah. And so, I've gone in there a few times. Uh, A lot of novelty, uh, not just Root Beers, but cream sodas and uh, great beverages and just all sorts of different stuff. So, I've been going in there semi-regularly getting novelty sodas. And I got one the other day that when I... Picked it up, the lady, the reception lady, cashier lady is like, have you had that before? It's like, nope. It's like, well, just so you're aware, it's really kind of divisive. People either love it or they hate it. So we're going to try that mysterious uh, love it or hate it beverage. It's called Moxie. Distinctly different. Established 1884. I'm going to open the bottle. I'm going to pour half of the bottle into a glass. So, again, read the label. What does it say? Moxie, original elixir. And its uh, catchphrase is distinctively different. Uh, it looks like your average soda, but uh, we're about to see what it tastes like. It smells like... A weird candy. How would you describe that smell? Yeah, it is kind of... It's really hard to place. Candy-like, I get... Yeah, I can see candy-like as a description for it. That's a weird flavor. It's like a, a cross between, like, those Neko candies and licorice. Like, black yeah, licorice. Yeah, I can see it. There's... Yeah. I think that's the smell I'm going for. It's kind of like those Neko candies is yeah. kind of what it smells like. It's kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Or like... Musty almost. What do you think of the taste? It's kind of a little bit bitter. Mm-hmm. It's not very strong. I kind of thought this was going to have a stronger flavor to it. It's not like overbearingly it's like strong, but it's not... sugar candy of some sort. Yeah. A sugar candy with a that's also got a bitter flavor to offset the sweetness. I might have to get this again just to try it again and decide what I think of it because I I can't tell if I like it or not. It's it's almost a neutral taste. I can't say that I dislike it, but I don't know that I'd buy it again. No. Or buy it, period. Maybe it grows on you. Yeah, maybe. Mm Mm-hmm. Is this something you could see yourself drinking one a day of? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> one a week? Probably not. But I think I would. I will definitely have a second just to further process my thoughts on this taste. Yeah, I, I definitely. It is uniquely different. I cannot think of anything that I've tasted that's quite like this. Yeah, Neko wafer. Yeah. That, I but can mixed see with, that. with black licorice. <clears throat> yeah. Or a licorice flavor. It's like a it's like a a candy that your grandparent would get you. Have you ever had kind the, of a blandish candy? Have you ever had the uh, Virgil's root beer? I don't think so. It's got a very licoricey flavor to it, and it reminds me of like the licorice flavor in that, but not mixed with root beer. Mm-hmm. 
So, I don't know. Yeah? Yeah. Cool.